I think it is clear to believe in the power of ideas. Fresh, thank you for the Manhattan Institute. Thank you. Once again, my name is Paul Howard, and I'm a director and a senior fellow at the Manhattan Institute's uh, Center for Medical Progress, as well as a member of our Project FDA initiative. Uh, I'd like to introduce our keynote speaker, Mark Levin. Mark is an industry leader with more than 25 years of experience building and operating leading biotech companies. He co-founded Third Rock Ventures in 2007 and focuses on the formation, development, and business strategy of, portfolio, of its portfolio companies, as well as actively identifying and evaluating new investments. He also assumes active leadership roles in Third Rock Venture portfolio companies functioning as COO through the first year or year and a half of the company's launch. He was also co-founder of Mayfield's Life Sciences Venture Fund and was the founding CEO of Tuleric, uh, cell Genesis, Focal Stem Cells, and Millennium Pharmaceuticals. He served as CEO of Millennium Pharmaceuticals for 12 years, and earlier in his career, he was a scientist at Lilly in Genentech. Uh, I have to say that if you look around at the um, venture environment right now for early stage biotech, there are not a lot of players left in that market. Uh, the money has gotten out. It's gone to other things like, uh, I don't know, the next Zynga uh, or Facebook, where the returns are uh, much higher, uh, and of course, you don't have to wait uh, 10 or 12 years to get your product to market, and you're not facing a 90% failure rate. So it's, it's a really a testimony to his leadership and his commitment to the science that uh, uh, his firm, uh, that he and his firm, uh, Third Rock, have remained committed to this, have remained committed to personalized medicine technologies through companies like Foundation Medicine that are really making a difference for patients everywhere, and also that he is committed to the policy discussion and willing to come here today and talk about you know, what's at stake for us, for patients everywhere, and for the U.S.'s role, frankly, as the leading uh, uh, locus of biopharmaceutical in innovation in the world. So please join me in welcoming Mark Levin. Thanks, Paul. It's great to be here. I, I guess I should announce today that we're actually moving our funds into social media, uh, <laughs> games and such, which are really critical, obviously. But uh, thanks for having me. It's really an honor to be here. I'd like to thank Andy and Paul and, of course, Peter and his great report, which was really exciting to read. Um, I don't know. How many people in the room had to get a tie when they came in? <laughs> okay, great. All right. I actually heard somebody had to get pants, too, so I'm not alone. I have a new tie here today. Well, what I wanted to do is um, talk a little bit about, I guess, kind of two sides of the coin here. I've never been so excited about the biology, the science, what can be done by everybody here in the room and obviously everybody in the industry. The time is extraordinary. The biology, the medicine, the big data concepts, it, it's just something that every morning I get up and I'm so thankful to be part of this. But the other part of it is, I guess to be honest with you, I'm somewhat pessimistic about our ability to really excel. I think obviously every day, every week, we're doing wonderful things. But I think we're actually missing the high mark in a big way. And so that's what I wanted to talk a little bit about today. Um, I appreciate the 25 years, Paul. Actually, I started 40 years ago at Lilly. Um, and when I started Lilly 40 years ago, and I was somewhat younger then, it seemed like everybody in the pharmaceutical industry, Lilly and other places, were just, just thrilled to death. Things were going well, infectious diseases, all kinds of great products, insulin, of course. It was a great time. 30 years ago, I joined Genentech in the early 80s, 81, and what an extraordinary place to be. Biotechnology, we're making proteins, we're going to cure all diseases, naturally occurring molecules, and it was an extraordinary time, and I was there for most of the 80s, and everything just seemed so optimistic in the industry. Pharma, of course, was doing fantastic. Um, in the late 80s, early 90s, I joined Venture Capital out in California at the Mayfield Fund, and we started companies in gene therapy and cell therapy, and signal transduction, and genomics. And again, the, the pharma industry, biotech, 
Wall Street, you know, everybody was smiling most of the time. I mean, it, there were ups and downs, of course. We had our ups and down years, but it was, it was, it was exciting. It was very exciting. Uh, and we founded Millennium in 1993. The genomics revolution for the 90s was incredible uh, to be part of that. It was a little off the charts, actually. It was like investing in social media today. It really wasn't truly valued. But pharma was doing well in the mid to late 90s, genomics revolution. And uh, it was really quite an incredible place to be. But you could actually see in the late 90s, and I'm going to come back to this, that trouble was brewing. You could feel it. Is that right, Newton? You could feel it. And we certainly felt it at Millennium uh, as, you know, we talked to our pharma partners and looked at the data. You could really feel it. So we, um, we started Third Rock about six years ago. And actually, we started Third Rock not because we thought things were going great in the industry, to be honest with you. We actually started Third Rock because we thought there was a big issue. And that's what I'm going to talk a lot about today. The big issue was that pharma was moving downstream pretty aggressively, and we heard you talk about Lilly is still doing a lot of basic research. Actually, a Lilly, in many ways, is an exception on a lot of these things, is that pharma is moving aggressively downstream. Lots of, they're cutting back dramatically on discovery. Venture capital is moving aggressively downstream. I can tell you for the last decade, venture capital and biotech, if they've returned a, a dollar for the dollar that was given them, they did well. Venture capital is moving aggressively downstream. The NIH budgets are being cut. And so what we said about six or seven years ago was, farmers downstream, ventures downstream, there's great science. Who's going to actually develop these great sciences? So we, we founded Third Rock around the idea there's a big hole there, that who's going to actually build companies around breakthrough science, whether it's epigenetics or cancer metabolism or certainly uh, molecular profiling in cancer. It go, the list goes on and on. And I think one of the key things, and I'm going to come back to this, is that maybe a, a piece of data that everybody's not aware of. On average, over the last maybe 15 to 20 years, 70% of the molecules that are approved every year by the FDA are originated between academia, biotech, and venture capital. Pharma is responsible for 30% of those from scratch. So think about what's, where the world is heading now. Pharma is moving downstream. Venture is moving downstream. There's no money to fund the early stage stuff. We're going to feel this in 10 to 15 years big time on breakthrough drugs. So that's a big part of what I wanted to talk about today. So one, I wanted to start with just give you kind of where I come from. I think Vicky started that way too, kind of. I'm not an immunologist, although I've seen all these crazy immunology charts all the time for the last 30 years. Uh, but I, I, I am an engineer, and I actually do believe in systems, but I want to tell you a little bit about that. Two, I want to talk about some of the big questions that we've all identified today. Three, I want to tell you a little bit about where I think the industry is today. I just want to give you a little history on where the industry was and where it is today. Talk a little bit about molecular medicine. I think everybody's covered that well. Just a couple of perspectives from my standpoint. And kind of a, a, a look at the future, what we call convergence, this convergence of extraordinary technologies, big data, correlations, molecular biology, systems biology, et cetera. I want to talk a little bit about where there is and then just some thoughts on how we can all work together. And we had a great conversation last night, and I, Andy actually spent 15, minute with, 15 minutes with me and told me about how the FDA is organized and things like that. Extraordinary. Maybe we can talk a little bit about that. And, you know, I want to talk a little bit about how we can really make a difference going forward, because for me, one of the biggest frustrations is there's, there's obviously lots of very bright people in the room and lots of great reports, but how do you really make a difference as opposed to constantly talking about it? So anyway, so the big questions actually, I'm sorry, I want to start with my perspective. Uh, so perspective is I am an engineer. I'm a biochemical engineer, and I love data, I love solutions, I love systems. And for me, if we talk about the FDA or CMS or big biology as independent events, I think that's dangerous. I think we have to integrate those into one system and decide how we're going to allocate our dollars to get the highest value for the patients and obviously the highest value for investors. So that is really very important to me. Yeah, I worked in discovery, I worked in development, I worked in manufacturing, I worked in commercial, I worked in investment. I've worked as CEOs of nine companies now, and I've worked with every major pharma company in the world. And it's been, I, I've really gotten a real sense, I think, of where things are going. So today, as an investor and as a biotech person, every day I come into the office and we sit in the middle, we talk to the NIH all the time. Every day we're wandering the halls of every major academic institution in this country. We've got 40 people on the team that visit everybody. 
We think we have our fingertips kind of on everything that's exciting in science. We spend about, we have four or 500 meetings a year with Big Pharma and Big Biotech because they're our customers today. Collaborations, acquisitions, building products together. And so with that in mind, we are worried. We are worried. And we, we're, we just don't see how this is going to be solved in any significant way. So I will come back to that, but I am really worried about the position we see today. One of the things that I heard a lot of great comments is, it's not just on the drug side. Uh, the diagnostic side is critical to developing drugs, and I can tell you from a reimbursement standpoint, being an investor, diagnostic investing is close to dead. Now, that's a little bit of an overstatement, but you cannot create shareholder value investing in incredible diagnostic companies today. So how are we going to go into these molecular medicine tests without these companies being built? In the device area, every device venture capital that I know and talk to, they're almost all out of the business. FDA, reimbursement, we're out of the business. So this is something that we see every day, and we should be worried about this. Not today, but 10 or 15 years from now, it's dramatically going to affect what's going on. So the big questions on my mind today, actually, and we talked about this last night, is from a U.S., United States standpoint, are we going to continue to be leaders in this field? We've been leaders 100 years. We've really dominated this space. I think we talked, again, we talked about it last night. We've paid, actually, for most of the development worldwide, and certainly on the R&D side. But it's not as clear. You know, we're spending a lot of time talking to people in China and India and around the world today. They're looking at these systems now not as legacy systems. They're building a lot of their regulatory agencies from scratch. They're building these institutions from scratch. They're thinking about what has the United States done wrong. And so I think if we look out 10 to 20, 30 years from now, we may be in for some big surprises. So to me, the question is, can the United States step up and innovate? Can it lead? Can we really get our ways through this? And one of the conversations we were having at the table a little while ago was, can we afford it? Because I agree with Newt. I, you, you know, I've had parents pass away from cancer. Every month, every two months is critical. But imagine if there's thousands of drugs out there that are $100,000 a piece that extend person, some person's life for a month. This, this, the U.S. economy cannot afford it. We can't afford it today. So we need to think about this whole idea of comparative effectiveness, which I thought was important a decade ago, about pharmacoeconomics and how we're really going to pay for all these things. But the problem is we're allocating dollars everywhere as opposed to the system. There's nobody thinking about the system, which is really very frustrating to us immunologists and engineers. And so, <laughs> so these things I, I actually do worry a lot about. Um, and so those are the kinds of questions that are certainly on my mind. So what I wanted to do next was just talk a little bit about where the industry comes from. And I think for me, again, it comes back to data. History is just as important, actually. The past is just as important in many ways as the future. And I think we have to look at history for data and to draw a conclusion. So that's, that's, I think, critical as we think about where this industry is going. I read a great book probably 15 years ago, Andy Grove, Only the Paranoid Survive. Did you read it? It's, 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 it's a fantastic book, and he talks about strategic inflection points. So I just want to talk about our industry for a second in the context of strategic inflection points. So the industry started in the 1820s, plus or minus, in Germany and in Europe, and it really came forward out of natural products, certainly, obviously, herbal medicine, coal tars, dyes. There were active molecules in these natural products, and, and there were entrepreneurs that pulled these together and built businesses. And so that really was really the first big strategic inflection point, a real big change in our industry. The second one occurred really in the late 1800s, early 1900s, where actually for the first time people said we can actually isolate the active molecules in these natural products. And if we isolate them, we can make them pure, we can manufacture them, we can ship them around the world. And in 1906, the food and, one of the first Food and Drug Act was, I guess, put in place. And Andy, you were there in 1906, is that right? Yeah. You did a, you did a fantastic job. So another big strategic inflection point. Uh, 1930s to 1960s, we saw the FIPCO finally, fully integrated pharmaceutical company. What happened is discovery companies around the world merged with manufacturing companies, merged with development companies. And in the 1950s, Pfizer hired their first five marketing people. I remember reading an article on this. So in the 50s, we had our really, truly first fully integrated pharmaceutical companies. But I think it's still fair to say we knew very little biology. This was all kind of essentially phenotypic screens 
on animals and human beings. We didn't understand the biology. The next major strategic inflection point, the big change, the big technology, was in the 60s and 70s with people like Sir James Black, where we started to understand receptor biology. You know, he developed hypertension drugs and anti-ulcer drugs, and we were, for the first time, really starting to say, oh my god, these natural products we're taking, they actually hit a target. They actually hit something. So we need to start thinking about how we can actually develop this biology. And so it was an incredible time. Again, 1962, Andy was still at the FDA. Uh, another major revolution uh, with regard to, obviously, thalidomide and additional safety rules and things like that. So that was really a, a huge change, the beginning of biology. 1980s, I had just joined Genentech. And the 80s to the 2000s, I think, for all of us here, was an incredible time. You know, we had molecular biology, we had proteins, we had antibodies, the genomic revolution, we're talking about personalized medicine. And we ended the decade, actually, we started the decade with 450 targets that all drugs had ever addressed. Jurgen Draves, former president of R&D at Roche, has written about this for years. We ended the decade with 22,000 targets, which we knew almost nothing about. And I'm going to come back to that. That is really at the center of a lot of the things that we were talking about today. Even though we have this great genomic revolution, we've got 22,000 targets that we have almost no biology on, and, and, and certainly no chemistry and pharmacology. So that is a real challenge. But the other thing that happened, it was the late 90s, and we all felt it, the industry, the pharma companies, were having major challenges with productivity. Their costs were going up dramatically. The amount of new molecules and new NMEs they were developing was dropping. Uh, we had IP, uh, IP expiring. The IP cliff was very dramatic. And very frankly, pharma existed to a great extent in the 90s by increasing prices and developing Me Too products. Now, that may not be too popular here, but I think that's actually how pharma did well in the late 80s and 90s. They weren't focused on breakthrough products as much as they were on Me Too products, price increases. And when that didn't work, uh, they acquired everybody they could. That had a product that had P&L, and then, of course, lots of people lost their jobs. But for a very short period of time, it actually gave Wall Street a good feeling. But the problem was, and I know all the heads of R&D and CEOs, we've talked to them. What happened then in the 2000s, of course, is they had 25 research sites around the world. They had tens of thousands of people. Lilly did not do this, but almost everybody else did. And it's a disaster. It was an absolute disaster. And we've seen that in this decade. And I think we've really seen that from a product productivity stand so, standpoint. So these were not the right solutions. So as we come into the 2000s, really the, maybe the sixth strategic inflection point, which I, I think maybe is our most exciting on the science side. We've talked this morning about big data, molecular medicine, right drug, right person, right time. Again, I, I think the sky is the limit here. But the system is going gonna, is gonna to kind of crunch us down, and we're going to do a lot of things very incremental for a long time unless we really get our hands around that. If you, if you remember, and I remember this well, and I'm sure a lot of the pharma people do, in the first five years of the 2000s, there was almost a trillion dollars lost in pharma value. The share prices plummeted, um, the mergers were done, and what pharma had to do was step back. Tens of thousands of people lost their job, lots of chemists lost their job uh, for the first time in a lot of the major companies, and the world has been flooded with pharmaceutical people, pharmaceutical executives, chemists, biologists, and the industry has contracted uh, dramatically. But what they did do is step up is, and we've seen this now, they're now doing more alliances and they're acquiring more companies. So it's an interesting time period, and this is where Third Rock, uh, the venture firm I'm part of, is now jumped in, is we've seen pharma contract, they're cutting back on discovery. They've been forced to do that, and in a good way. They can't have those sites all over the world. Productivity is down actually 50-fold over the last 30 years. Um, they're cutting back on discovery. It costs too much money. They're spending more time with biotech. But now what's happening with biotech is the early-stage biotech companies are not being founded. I can tell you, I sit there every day. We're founding three or four a year. All of our colleagues are going away. It's really very scary. So we have to think about where are these new companies going to come from. And the reason, and I'll come back to this, is that is they're not being founded. Is I, and I talk to everybody in biotech, everybody uh, on the venture side, reimbursement, regulation, dollars. 
The whole system is not working, and it's really a mess. And if you talk about a lot of discouraged people in early biotech, they're out there. Believe me, they're out there. They're trying to figure this out. So I, topic four I just wanted to cover for a second was kind of the whole molecular revolution, and Peter and everybody else talked about it very well. And just to talk about it kind of from my perspective, we got involved at Millennium. We founded Millennium in the early 90s. It was based on finding the root cause of human disease. And we believed in personalized medicine. We spent 10 years on it. And we were early, actually. We were very early. Um, uh, the information was not there. The understanding of these 22,000 targets was not there. Pharma was not ready for it. They weren't ready to segment their marketplaces. The FDA was not ready for it. CMS was not ready for it. But it was a combination of those things. And actually, in general, the biology was not there. But it was an extraordinary time, and now it's actually picking up dramatically. We've talked about GWAS studies and next-gen sequencing, systems biology. I want to come back to this. Gene sequencing is not enough. We need to be talking about proteomics, metabolomics. We need to be talking about epigenetics. These are going to be key pieces to these molecular diagnostics in the future. Biomarkers, translational medicine, genotype, phenotype information. Every company we start today in personalized medicine, we're doing registries. We're collecting data, long-term data, phenotypic data, genotypic data, outcome data. Absolutely critical to drug discovery and drug development. So the world has changed a lot. And I think on the cancer side, we've all seen these incredible breakthroughs. Gleevec, maybe 10 years ago or so, with the BCR able translocation um, with Herceptin, HER2, and we've heard about AL this morning, I think, and BRAF, and Actually, recently, Vertex had this incredible breakthrough on cystic fibrosis, if everybody followed that. 4% uh, of kids that have cystic fibrosis have a very specific mutation. And Vertex, based on structural biology, has, has developed a molecule that hits that very specific mutation and is making a big difference in these kids' lives. It's just incredible. And actually, at, at Third Rock, we're also very excited, and I was loved hearing this conversation on rare genetics disorders this morning. We're spending a tremendous amount of time on that. Um, we've seen, of course, Genzyme with Gauchet's and Fabrase and many of the other lysosomal enzyme disorders has really been a breakthrough. But now, actually, gene therapy is coming back. We're treating adrenal leukodystrophy kids. Uh, that's a rare genetic disorder the young boys have. If you saw Lorenzo's oil, over a three or four or five year period, they degenerate to, the, to just a horrible kind of comatose, comatose state and then die. We've treated two young boys with gene therapy, replacing the gene in their marrow, and they've gone back to school. So I can go through a whole long list now of breakthroughs in gene therapy and cellular therapy, new regenerative medicine. It's really quite extraordinary. The other thing that I'm so excited about and we talked about this this morning, as we look at congestive heart failure and obesity and diabetes and many more of these polygenic disorders, there is hope. I think we originally thought when we did the GWAS studies, we were going to identify three or four or five dominant genes. And I remember hearing this from all the, the senior geneticists in the field in the early 90s, three or four genes. There were going to be great targets. Hopefully, we can drug them. And you know we're on our way. Well, as it turns out, the GWAS studies are identifying very rare genes that affect a very small percentage of the population. And as it turns out, these, these larger disorders are going to be very polygenic. They could have 10, 15, 20, 50, 100 genes involved, modifier genes. It's going to be a lot more complicated than we thought. But what we're now doing, and this is critical, but it's, it, it's not being done enough, and a lot of it is regulatory issues and reimbursement issues, is we're looking at congestive heart failure, uh, diseases like hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. It's a genetic disorder. You probably hear about all these athletes all the time, basketball players, football players, just fall, dropping dead on the court. It's, it's reasonably common. There's been a lot of great work now looking into this disease, looking very specifically at subsets of these young people that have this disorder. We're now developing those as products for those particular young people with a molecular genetic. My point is, molecular diagnostic, my point is that larger diseases can be subsetted into small diseases. And one of the hopes for the future, of course, is that large diseases become rare genetic disorders in many sense. They become a rare genetic disorders from a target standpoint, from a regulatory standpoint, from a reimbursement standpoint. And we're doing that in obesity. There's a subset of people that are obese that have an MC4 mutation, almost a million patients in the United States. We have a molecule in the clinic right now where people are losing weight. But you subtype the patients, you deliver this. So obesity is not, 
It's not a single disease, as we know. It's dozens of diseases with dozens of modifiers. So the future is bright, and we're very excited about that. And I was also, again, very excited about hearing about big data. Our biggest issue today on big data, and we're collecting it again on everything we do, is collect genotype data, collect phenotype data, uh, collect outcome data, and we, t we talked a lot about retrospective data, and I think the panel mentioned this. Most of this data, unfortunately, is not very good. Remember, this data was collected on all kinds of medical reports and hospitals, stuffed in boxes all over the world, and these retrospective studies in general, uh, some of them are good, are not going to be valuable. We're going to have to do a lot of very detailed, careful, prospective studies to really understand genotype, phenotype, and outcome and pharmacoeconomics. Now, another key piece of this is, and I couldn't agree more with what many of the panelists said, is that genotype data is interesting, but it's just mutations. We're going to have to expand that. We're going to have to be looking at epigenetic data. We're going to have to be looking at metabolomic data, proteomic data, if we really want to understand not the, just the genetics, but what's really happening biochemically. And that's now being done in many cases. That's going to be critical. The question is, can we really afford it? I mean, that, that, that is doable today. Can we afford it? Who's going to develop it? Are the early stage companies develop it? I don't think Big Pharma will. So I think it's a big question for all of us. Where, where is that going to come from? So let me just wrap up with a couple things. One, I just wanted to t talk about kind of my dream for the future. And we actually talk about these projects all the time at Third Rock. And it really is kind of a convergence of a lot of technologies. And I'm going to mention three scenarios. I think all doable over the next 10 to 20 years. I think we have to be careful. A lot of times people say, oh, this can be done in five years. This, these things take 10, 20, 30 years. But one scenario is a patient is diagnosed with lung cancer. The sample is sent to a company. The company sequences that sample, but not just sequences it. Does metabolomics on it, proteomics on it, epigenetics profile. Uh, the patient is uh, given a full report of all their mutations, all their modified genes, all their biochemistry, essentially, by looking at these additional things above and beyond genotype. Of course, the oncologist gets it also. There's an algorithm that's now been developed with a million patients. This is the future now. A million patients, 10 million patients. That data from that person, their genotype and their proteomics type, is blasted against a million patients that have been treated with all kinds of different drugs in lung cancer. Out of that pattern recognition comes back three or four drugs that are important in that area. Those three or four drugs, are, they're targeted drugs now, are given to that patient along with cancer immunotherapy. I don't know if everybody's followed the cancer immunotherapy area. It's really very exciting. It's an area it, that you might, it's not surprising. Cancer cells are smart. They turn your immune system down. So now we, being the whole scientific community, is finding new molecules that turn the immune system back up. So you take these three or four targeted drugs, you combine it with cancer immunotherapy, you potentially combine it with an epigenetics drug that's involved in a large program, and you may even use a cytotoxic that kills cells. What, what does that do? It gets us into the age regimen, something that Peter and others have talked about. Now, we've, we've been successful in testicular cancer and some lymphomas and others. These other cancers are much more complicated. Solid tumors are very complicated. But this is doable over the long term. The challenge, of course, is who's going to develop that? Who's going to pay for it? How in the world is the FDA going to actually look at these multiple molecules together in trials? And, you know, we know we're doing the iSpy trial and others today. Peter certainly talked about um, adaptive trials in Bayesian, critical to this. But it's going to be these combination of drugs that are going to be necessary. A second area that we talk a lot about is a child is born, and there's lots of kind of questions about whether this makes sense, but I can tell you some of the major hospitals in the country are doing this now. The child is born. Genomic gen genome is done on a chip, as we talked about, but above and beyond the genome, the proteome, metabolomics, epigenetics profiles, that's all in a database. The, the, we know how that, how that child might progress, the different propensities towards different diseases. Um, then that's in a database. Now, the child has an annual checkup where the same, check, where the same uh, potentially data is accumulated. Also, blood samples. One of the things that certainly we're talking a, lot, talking a lot about today is what we call molecular stethoscope, and a lot of you I know are working in that space. 
You take a blood sample, you look at uh, DNA, you look at RNA, you look at rare proteins. We're going to be able to pick up disease long before anybody ever suspected it. You know, the, tra the traditional analytes that we now get for liver enzymes, et cetera, those will be part of the past in the future as we're able to develop these new techniques. So a person, anyway, early on in their life has preventative medicine. Imagine preventative medicine. That makes a lot more sense probably than treating these things afterwards. So will society deal with that? The technologies will be there. You know, it's 10, 20, 30 years away, or it could be 50 to 100 years away based on how we look at it. The final one I wanted to talk a little bit about was a topic we talked a little bit about this morning was convergence. And Convergence is an area that we talk a lot about, and it's, it's not our term, but we think about how do we combine drugs, devices, diagnostics, uh, information technology, big data, and correlations that come out of that big data to treat people. So imagine we have a heart patient, congestive heart failure, mitocardial infarction, arrhythmia patient. One of the most exciting things that are happening today now is one, of course, this person would be profiled, not genetically necessarily, as much as proteomically, metabolomically, trying to figure out what's going on in the heart. And you can look for a lot of particular proteins, particular, that can tell you what's happening in the heart. Cell therapy, there's a lot of trials now going on in cell therapy. So this person will be treated with cell therapy. The person will also potentially get different drugs. Cell therapy that actually would regrow myocytes, which is really quite extraordinary. Drugs and potentially a device, probably an external defibrillator. People are developing these now where they'll measure actually your heartbeat and a lot of other, other measurements that could be very important. We've talked a lot about monitoring this morning. We're seeing a lot of technologies out of the MIT Media Center and others where, uh, as Linda was talking about, it's just not these watches that you know, measure uh, things that are kind of interesting, how many steps you walk, but we're looking now at conductance measurements that potentially measure sympathetic nervous system. How do they relate to uh, potentially myocardial infarction? How do they relate to epilepsy? And so potentially a person would wear a monitor along with cell therapy and drugs, and they would be monitored on a regular basis, and a person's life could be dramatically expanded. Convergence of a lot of different technologies. So anyway, these are dreams for the future. These technologies actually are not that far out there. The biology in many cases is, but I think the biggest challenge is, is not just the FDA, or not just CMS, or not just no investment, or not just biology, it's the integrated system. And so I think the biggest challenge is, you know, we can go off here and pour a lot of money and uh, information into one system, but if there's bottlenecks in the rest of the system, we're not going to get very far. So I think that's something that we all need to think about. So for me, I am, I am excited about the future, and at the same time, I actually am somewhat pessimistic is not the right word, because the industry is doing incredible things. It, uh, FDA approved 39 drugs last year. A lot of them were breakthrough drugs. That was an important year. But one of the things, actually, that happened to the industry, and this is an, kind of an important data piece, is that in the mid-'90s, with the size of the industry, there was about 25 or 30 drugs being approved every year. Companies like Pfizer needed 10 breakthrough drugs a year to grow at, at 10 percent. Companies like Lilly, I think, probably needed three to five breakthrough drugs a year. If there's 25 to 30 drugs approved per year for all 25 major pharma companies, we've got a problem, a big problem. So we have a big problem in productivity. We have a big problem in figuring out reimbursement. Um, I can tell you on the investment side, early stage, we're going to feel this in a big way in 10 years. Uh, we see everything every week. Very little money is going into diagnostics, breakthrough diagnostics. They're out there. But CMS, and a gentleman back here mentioned it, will not reimburse. They're cutting prices, they're giving confusing information. The same thing with regard to the FDA, with CLIA Labs and IBD, very confusing. Same thing on devices, same things on drugs. You're gonna see a much lower level of investment in these early stage efforts. So how do we go forward? I think it is a big challenge, and we talked about this last night. For me, the most important thing, and uh, it took me a long time to, to, to learn this, is that it's not just great ideas or smart people or hard work. It's overall leadership with an overall vision about how do you really maximize and lead the system. Yeah, I've worked in a lot of companies over the last 40 years, and if you know, I think about this whole effort as a company, the way I think about it, and 
you know, if we ran, and we don't run companies very well, but if we ran companies like we're running this overall system, they'd all be bankrupt. They'd all be bankrupt. But what's great about a company today, if it's reasonably run, there's an overall vision. There's an overall strategy. There's one, three, and five, and ten year goals. You hire the right people for the right jobs. You organize correctly. You allocate dollars to the higher priority areas at the right time. When I look at what we're doing in reimbursement, or what we're doing in regulatory, they don't really talk to each other most of the time, or how we're investing dollars, or the fact, actually, one of the most important things, actually, is an Uber biology effort, to be honest with you, and this come up a lot today. I mentioned we've got 22,000 new genes. Those 22,000 new genes create 100,000 to a million new proteins. We don't understand this. This is going to take decades. So are we going to just kind of have a 1,000 academic groups in the NIH work on this, or can we get an organized effort we're over the next 10 to 20 years, much like Silicon Valley did, much like uh, President Kennedy did with the moonshot maybe 50 years ago. We need structure, we need organization, we need leadership if we're gonna make a big difference. And so for me, I continue to be excited about the area. Everybody here is doing great things. We are definitely underperforming based on the way the system is today. Thank you very much. We just want to take a, a few questions. Um, so, uh, please identify yourself. Sir. Joe Panetta with Biocomp. So, Mark, I wonder what your perspective is on this new model that I think uh, GSK announced a couple of weeks ago where they partnered with Avalon Ventures in San Diego to create 10 new biotech companies and they're going to put a total of $450 million into it. Do you think that's a, 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 a worthwhile undertaking? Yeah, I mean, just in general, and we were, Mike and I were talking about this at the table a few minutes ago, is pharma actually is being very entrepreneurial these days, which they need to. They're, they're trying these new kinds of things, and I'll come back to that uh, with Avalon Ventures, GSK is. They're starting reinvigorating their venture firms. They're starting up Pfizer, starting up these in, interesting collaborations with companies around the world, I'm sorry, with academia around the world. They're doing all kinds of new things. And so they're being very entrepreneurial. They did try this in the 90s, by the way, uh, with a lot of uh, universities, and it was a total failure for the most part. So I think the most important thing is, no matter what they do, because I think any, it's a good idea. Any good idea you pick, you need to allocate, and again, it's very simple. You just can't say, you know, here's some money, go do it. You have to form teams with the right people. You have to work together. You have to collaborate. You have to share data. You have to share expertises. And if that doesn't happen, it won't work. So what Glaxo and Avalon are doing, and we know the system well because we've talked to Glaxo a, a lot about it over the last few years, is they've decided in discovery inside their organization, they can't really identify new targets. They can't figure out what these 22,000 targets do. And that's fair. It takes a lot of research for sometimes 10 years to figure out what a single target does. So they're working with Avalon. They're going out in the world into academia around the world. They have people in Europe, China, and the US. They're finding biological academic labs that have done a lot of work on a single target. And Avalon's going to put $3 million into that, as I remember. And they're going to bring that into GSK. And then they're going to try to take that biological information that that academic had, get some chemistry around it, get chemical tools, get it into animals, and see if those actually make a difference in those animal models. So they're not necessarily companies. They're projects around targets, as I understand. And then if it goes a certain distance, then they will buy Avalon out on that particular target. So to me, it's a way of thinking, hey, we can't do the biology of the world at GSK. Makes sense. We want to work with the best academic labs in the world on new targets. And it's a very innovative, creative idea. It's going to depend on people and people working together very closely. Uh, Mark, if I could ask a question. You're talking about, you know, uh, for some illnesses, a, a drug, a diagnostic, a cell therapy. Um, you know, uh, traditionally, that I think would make the regulator very confused. <laughs> and the FDA is arguably not yeah. set up. Right. You know, it, it's got its own silos. Every organization has silos to not use those technologies. Is there a proof of concept you build outside the agency? Who takes the lead in developing a paradigm where four or five technologies are developed at the same time? No, I, I, I guess I can tell you right now is that Sitting out there today in between academia, the NIH, and biotech, and big pharma, I would say almost nobody. 
Those things sit because we all sit around and say the FDA, and you know, we're not prepared to do all that today. Those were future scenarios, but they're definitely doable. We're not going to do that. People sit around today on breakthrough devices. I've met with the best device venture capitalists in the country. We are not going to do a device because the 510K and the PMA process is so screwed up. We wait for years for action. We're, we're out of the business. Same thing on diagnostics. They talk more about CMS. The reimbursement system there, as we talk to diagnostic venture capitalists and we may collaborate with them, they say we are not doing that. Because look what the, the information that CMS has just given us on reimbursement, we don't understand it. And they're going to change it again in 12 months. So I guess my point is right now, these complicated systems and these breakthrough ideas will not be funded. We're one of the only groups left in venture capital today that are even funding early stage biology. So uh, again, I worry not today, I worry about 10 and 15 and 20 years from now because pharma has moved downstream. And I think there's a nice match there between academia, biotech, venture capital, and pharma, which is a great development organization, great on commercialization, and some discovery. There's great synergies. But the problem is the whole system is not structured right now to really incent those collaborations for a lot of the early stuff. Any additional questions? Terrific. Please join me in thanking Mark Levin. Yeah, thanks a lot. I think it is clear how fortunate we are to believe in the power of ideas. Supply the common sense and the fresh thinking of the Manhattan Institute.